Hey, it's Art from My New Microphone. Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I would like to discuss 13 techniques and concepts that have drastically improved my mixes throughout the years. Now, some of these concepts and techniques I learned long ago in the early days of my music production career. However, some of them I have started implementing more recently and have seen great results as a result of implementing them. I always try to keep a beginner's mindset and try to soak up as much knowledge and experiment as much as possible when I'm producing music, not only for my own work and my own knowledge, but also so that I can share it with you here on YouTube. So I'd like to share 13 of these techniques and concepts with you, but rather than just sitting here and talking about it, let's be about it and hop right into our digital audio workstation so that I can explain it and also demo it for you as we go along. So let's hop directly into Logic Pro. All right, here we are inside of Logic Pro to discuss the top techniques and concepts that have helped improve my mixes. In this session, we are working on a song called Wise Man by Lindsay Meisner and the Seventh Mystic. I will leave a link in the description box down below once this track is made available to the public. And this is something that I mixed fairly recently that has many of these points within the mixing session. So I felt it was a good example to work on in this video. Now, I've been mixing professionally for the last seven or eight years, five years in a professional studio locally, and then a bit less so in the last few years as I've been building up my new microphone, mostly on the blogging side. So I wouldn't consider myself a top 1% mixing engineer by any stretch of the imagination. However, I think that part of the allure is kind of growing together here on the YouTube channel. So as I'm learning things and experimenting, I will always share them with you so we can grow together here in the My New Microphone community. So with that bit of rambling out of the way, the first concept that has really helped improve my mixes is having a consistent workflow and using mix templates. So in this particular song, I used a template that I used across the album. There are, I believe, seven songs in the album that I mixed. And so every mix is set up the same. The same instruments were used in each of the tracks. It's a nine piece band. So we have drums, bass, two guitars, a lead vocalist, keys on some tracks. We have a couple of background vocals. We've got a trumpet, trombone and saxophone. So here we have our drums first right here in the red. We've got a couple of VCAs, a VCA for the kicks, including a kick sample here, a VCA for the snares, including the snare sample, the snare plate reverb effects return that I have here that I'm automating. That's why it's right here. That's Tom's overhead room, followed by the bass. I actually have the bass split up into a low band and a high band. That's going to the bass subgroup right here. We have our two guitars. We have our saxophone, sax solo in the case of this track, trombone panned all the way to the left, and then another trombone in the center with a doubler on it. This helps fill up the stereo spectrum when the trombone is not harmonizing with other instruments. We have a trumpet right here that is not playing all the time, hence the use of this trombone with the doubler. We have our horns subgroup and VCA right here. We have our horns room track right here, horns VCA, horns subgroup lead vocal, vocal throws, which we will get to shortly, background vocal one, background vocal two, and vocal bus. And then on top of that, we have our effects returns right here. We see drum parallel compression, mono delay, guitar verb left, guitar verb right, extra delay, a long plate, a vocal reverb, a bigger reverb, a funk guitar parallel compression, a saxophone parallel saturation, a saxophone verb. These I actually set up specifically for this track about the saxophone solo and the guitar leading up to the saxophone solo. But the majority of the tracks here were set up as a template. So once I got the first song mix in this album, I simply created a template and then loaded that template up and put the multi tracks of all the other songs into that template and moved forward doing it that way. This set up a strong framework and overall workflow that I could just get in set up the multi-tracks and get right to mixing, knowing what I was dealing with with each of the instruments, how each of the players were performing throughout the entire recording session. And I went into each mix with a general idea of what I wanted out of the mix. So you can set up specific workflows and templates per project. In this case, it was an album project, but I also have specific templates for different genres that I tend to work on where I have the individual elements that are typical of those genres spaced out, making it that much easier for me to hop right into the mix and get started right away, knowing what I need to do in the template. So this helps me save time, helps me focus on the actual mixing rather than the minutia of setting up all my routing and everything to suit the song, which ultimately, for me at least, gives me better results. 
All right, the second concept or philosophy that has really helped improve my mixes is that of three-dimensional mixes. So mixes having height, width, and depth. Now I have videos going more into detail on height, width, and depth and the overall concept of 3D mixing. I will leave links to those in the description box down below if you'd like to check those out. But essentially the dimension of height refers to the overall frequency content. So we need a nice balance of low end, a nice balance of top end, and a nice balance in the mid range to have a great sense of height in the mix. And we can also go through different sections of the song and make certain sections taller or smaller than the others to really have that nice contrast throughout the mix to help push things forward and add overall interest across the mix. So in the case of this mix, we have the bass guitar and the kick drum, the toms really holding down the low end. The snare is holding a lot of that low mid range along with the guitars and the saxophones and vocals. And then we've got a lot of nice brilliance on the horns and the vocals, depending on the section that we are playing. In terms of height modulation, there's not a whole lot going on. However, there is a break section right here where I boost up the perceived volume of the bass right here with some automation. You can see on the bass, I have the R bass by Waves, the Renaissance bass which effectively adds in more presence to the low end by enhancing the harmonics just above the low end. So in this case, we are enhancing harmonics of fundamental frequencies below 110 hertz, and I'm just boosting up the intensity of this a little bit in the break. So we can have a quick listen to this into the break. just a little bit of a bass boost there to modulate the overall height of the mix. It doesn't play a drastic role. It's not like I'm high passing the entire mix in the buildup before an EDM drop, let's say, but it does help to just add a little bit of extra movement and excitement to the mix by having a bit more bass presence or low end presence in this break section right here. And you can see over here as well in this break by the marker right here. I have the Renaissance bass intensity boosted up a little bit once again to help push that bass a little bit forward. All right, next up, the concept of width basically applies to the differences between the left and right stereo channels. And this is mostly done through panning. You can see here that I have the trombone and trumpet panned hard left and hard right respectively. I have the guitars panned out as well. And right here, if I open up the automation once again, you can see that we are modulating a bit of the width of the guitars, where in this section they are a bit wider at negative 45 and plus 44. And then in the break, we see that they kind of come in a little bit. This guitar comes right into the center while this one is still panned out to the right. And then during the sax solo, they are narrower where they are panned negative 30 and plus 30. And then for the final chorus and outro, they are panned hard left and hard right, just as a way to make the guitars in this instance wider for the end, allowing more space for the important elements in the center. If we look at the horns as another example, we can see that the saxophone right here is panned right up the center, while the trombone in this case is panned hard left and the trumpet is panned hard right. However, in other sections, like this horn part right here, the horn break, we see that the trumpet is not playing. And so we have this trombone track right here with the waves doubler. And what I have here is actually the mono channel turned off right here. You can see that that is turned off the direct signal. And what we have are the two doubled signals. One is panned hard left delay of 12.4 milliseconds with a detune of plus six cents. And the second is hand hard right with a delay of 3.6 milliseconds and a detune of negative six cents. So with the trombone effectively doubled and hard panned left and right, and the saxophone panned up the middle, we get a sense of having two horns to the sides and one horn up the center. So we can have a listen to what these horns sound like in solo, just to get a sense of what this sounds like. <laughs> So you heard that really fill out when I turned the doubler on on the trombone and when it was off, the horns were very much more mono. Now I have these horns being sent to a few stereo effects so they won't be completely mono because they are feeding to the long plate here which is in stereo. However, you could hear in this section that the trombone when the doubler was turned on made the overall horn section sound wider. Let's have a listen to what they sound like in the chorus.
So there we have the saxophone up the middle, the trombone hard left, and the trumpet hard right. And what if I brought in the guitars for this section as well? So we've got some good width going on there, and that makes a lot of room for the center elements to take up the center image of the mix. That is including things like the kick drum, the snare, the lead vocal and the bass. And finally, we have the concept of depth within the mix. And the main tool that we have for depth is our faders. So if something is quieter, we will automatically perceive it as being further away. And that's how we can move things further up or further back in the mix. So if we quickly scroll through our session here, we can see that the balance is pretty straightforward in this mix. We see that the background vocals here are a bit lower than the lead vocal. Let's have a listen to that. So the background vocal has been doubled and pushed out to the far left and the far right, and it's also a little bit quieter than the lead vocal right here. Now another tool we have for depth is the high end. So if we are closer to a sound source in nature, we will hear more of that high end frequency that that sound source is producing because the air between us and the sound source won't soak up so much of that small waveform energy. The further we are from a sound source, the greater the friction will be, especially in those high frequencies, which have the shorter wavelengths and the air or other media will soak up a lot of that energy before it gets the chance to reach our ears. And so if we are closer to something, we will hear more top end. If we are further from something, we will hear less top end. So if we open up our EQ, for example, here, we see that I'm adding in a lot of top end on the lead vocal, and then I am still adding in some top end on the background vocal, however, not nearly as much. So by adding in some top end right here, and then some more presence right here at 3.88 kilohertz, we can push that lead vocal more up front in the mix, and then we are not pushing the background vocal as hard in the mix here in the top end. So let's toggle these high end controls on and off and have a listen to what that sounds like when we solo the vocals. Is it overwhelming for you, dear? Do you like to laugh at me when I'm crying out? Is there something I can't control? So in this instance, even though the background vocals are pushed out wide and are not taking up the center image, they almost sound as if they're a bit closer because they have more of that high end energy. Now, in this case, I'm really pushing the background vocals up and I'm really taking away a lot of that energy in the lead vocal. So this is pretty extreme processing. However, I just wanted to show you what that could sound like. Another great tool we have for increasing the perceived depth within a mix is reverb. Now, the thing with reverb is we can use it to push a sound source further back in the mix, especially when we get higher amounts of wet signal compared to the dry signal. I didn't really do that too much in this mix. However, I did use a lot of reverb to create space to make certain elements sound like they are in a certain space relative to that reverb. So for example, I gave the snare drum a sense of depth by sending it to a snare plate. We can have a listen to what that sounds like. So you hear that the snare plate there didn't really move the snare back, but it did give the overall snare sound a more dimensional space with a great sense of depth and even a little bit of width. So reverb is great not only for depth, but also for width. And another great tool we have for depth is actually using compression. We can see here again on the snare that we have a compressor here with a slow attack time and a rather fast release time. And this will help shape the transients of the snare to help that initial attack poke out and make it sound a little bit closer. So let's have a quick listen to that with it toggled on and off. So perhaps it's not perfectly level matched, but the attack is just slightly more with this compressor on. This is the CLA 76, which emulates the black revision of the 1176 by Yuri. Great compressor plugin, I really love using this. And I also use it for the opposite effect on the drum room here. So we can open this up and see that we have a fast attack and a fast release. So in this case, 
the compressor is not allowing any of that initial transient energy to poke through. Rather, it's clamping down as soon as it detects those transients, which can help make this track sound even further away because the room mic was positioned far away from the kit. And so it sounds by nature further away, but this compression helps push it back that much more. So let's open up this SSL as well. You can see that we also have some compression going on here with a fast attack, fast release. So let's have a look at the compression that's happening on the SSL as well as the CLA-76. I'll toggle back and forth to really hear what's going on. So you hear there that even though I'm adding some top end energy at around 8K, this roll off at 10K along with the compression makes this room sound further back in the mix. So that is how compression and EQ can be used to alter the depth of a signal or a track within the mix. And before I wrap up on this point right here, I also just want to mention that any stereo effects will ultimately affect the overall width of the mix. I forgot to mention that previously, but in this case we have big snare reverb right here that is in stereo that will help. We have a reverb right here for the snare. We have a reverb here for the sax solo that is also in stereo that will help. We've got a long plate in stereo. We have these mono reverbs for the guitar that are hard pan to the opposite side of the guitar feeding them. That will help with width as well. And we have a stereo delay right here that also helps to enhance the perceived width of the mix. So I could go on and on about three-dimensional mixing. It is a important lens through which I see mixing and have really honed in on the concept or the idea of 3D mixing in recent years. All right, concept number three that has really helped me in my mixes is to not be afraid to push processors hard in the mix. You hear sometimes people saying, don't boost more than 3 dB or don't compress more than 6 dB. And I think that this is all utter BS. If it sounds good, go for it and be aggressive in some instances with compression, EQ, saturation, reverb, whatever, because it's in pushing these processes hard where a lot of character comes from and a lot of happy accidents even come from when experimenting in mixing and music production. So for example, we can look at this lead vocal once again, I'll open up this SSL channel and you can see that right here at about 12K, I'm boosting by just over 9 dB. Now that is completely contrary to the don't boost more than 3 dB or don't boost at all kind of school of thought with EQ, but it really helps bring out that high end of the vocal and helps it sit that much better in the mix, making it that much more upfront. Same thing goes with the compression on the vocal. We can see here, if I play this back. Why do you take me in and then leave me on the ground? So there I was peaking at about negative 10 dB or 10 dB of gain reduction and I was regularly hitting 7 right there. And that is along with the compression that is happening with the SSL channel strip right here, which is hovering around 3 dB of gain reduction there. And on top of that, we see that we are compressing a little bit with the de right here, particularly in the frequencies around 8700. So overall, I'm hitting this vocal probably with almost 15 dB of compression in some instances. A lot of mixing engineers hit it a lot harder than that. And depending on the style, I would also hit it harder than I am in this particular mix here. On top of the compression, I'm also adding a bit of limiting so we can have a listen to what this is. So another 3 dB of gain reduction there. So not only am I hitting, in this case, the CLA-76 pretty hard, along with the EQ of the SSL channel strip, but I'm also reducing the gain with compression across multiple stages in this vocal. So ultimately, there's going to be significant gain reduction right here. And what I'm trying to say is to not be afraid of doing that. Now that is on a individual track right here, but we can also do that in our effects returns, particularly with our parallel effects. So for example, the parallel compression I have here on the drums is rather intense. We have our SSL bus comp right here, and then the decapitator by sound toys and let's have a listen to the chorus here and i will solo the drums and the drum parallel compression
So you hear there that the actual parallel compression channel is pretty intensely compressed. It's really crushed, but then when I bring it underneath, it acts to enhance the overall thickness of the drums in the overall mix. Another way I'm using pretty intense processing is on the parallel saturation right here on the sax solo. So if I just solo this and listen to the sax solo, you see here that I have a doubler and a micro shift to really push this effect out to the sides. And then I have the decapitator right here with the drive set all the way up to 10 and the Ampex mode right here under style. So let's have a listen, just the parallel channel right here. So it's really crushed there, really distorted. And now if I bring the actual saxophone over top of it, let's have a listen to that. So it just helps give a little bit of energy to the sax. It doesn't draw attention to itself, which is nice because it is fairly extreme processing, but it helps give a little bit of character and grit to that solo that we don't necessarily hear, but we will feel in the context of the mix. So let's listen to the solo with the rest of the mix going on here. So you heard there that as I pushed it up, it didn't sound the greatest, but as I brought it down, it really blended in and helped push that saxophone a little bit harder in the context of the mix. So don't be afraid to push your processors hard, whether that's compression, EQ, saturation, or anything else, because it can really add character and sonic excitement to your music productions and mixes. All right, technique number four that really helped benefit me, and this is more of a personal one, is to use high shelf boosts. Now I've already showed a few high shelf boosts in this video, particularly on the vocals here, the lead vocal, and I'm sure that I have one here on the saxophone if we go in. Yeah, I have 3.8 dB at 8K right here. I'll often do this on snares as well. I didn't in this mix because there was so much bleed in the snare that I kind of rounded some of that off in the top end. However, for me personally, my mixes were always lacking in the top end. I would always focus a lot on the bass, Maybe that's because I started off with hip hop and EDM, but I never really understood the importance of that brilliance range or that upper presence range. And so when I started watching people ahead of me in their mixing careers mix, and I saw a lot of them using these high shelf boosts on many of their tracks, I thought, well, that's probably the reason why my mixes are not sounding as good as they are and why they are not having that high end brilliance that I hear on professional records. And so I feel like I'm still a bit shy with this in my own mixes. I still feel like they are a little bit dark compared to the mainstream mixes I listen to. However, a nice high shelf boost can really help bring out a track or a subgroup within the mix, particularly again on vocals and percussion where appropriate. So maybe you're in a position where your mixes sound overly bright and harsh and this is not an issue for you and maybe you need to focus more on the low mids or the mid range or even the low end. However, for me personally, I found that just boosting the high shelf of a few instruments within the mix really helped bring them to life and add that presence and brilliance that was really lacking from my mixes beforehand. All right, technique number five that helped improve my mixes is the use of clipping. Now, when I was learning to mix and when a lot of you are learning to mix, we are taught to avoid clipping at all costs. And this is particularly true on our individual tracks, on our subgroups and our mix buses. Now, as an aside, in 32-bit floating point, it's not as important that we don't clip any of our individual tracks. So long as what we are exporting out of our sessions isn't clipped, we should be all right. However, it's still best practice to never go and clip any of our tracks, our plugins, or anything like that, which is why I think that gain staging is so important. As a little foreshadowing for you, gain staging is actually concept number 11 in this video, so stay tuned for that. But using clipping as more of a distortion slash dynamic range controlling effect in the mix can really help improve the perceived loudness of our track and give us a bit more headroom in the mix and even add a lot of grit and character to the audio tracks that we are processing with clipping. So clipping, for those of you who don't know, is effectively chopping off the top and bottom extremes of an audio signal. We can have soft clipping, which is a bit more rounded, and we can have hard clipping or digital style clipping that just simply shaves it off and flattens out the audio signal at a maximum or set threshold point. So the result of clipping is, of course, distortion, 
position as we are distorting the waveform. And if we really start crushing it, we can ultimately end up with a waveform that looks like a square wave. Square waves have equal energy in each odd harmonic. And so hard clipping will give us more of a square wave type distortion that often sounds rather harsh because we aren't used to hearing those upper harmonics way up in the harmonic series. But using clipping, especially on transient information, we can effectively reduce the overall amplitude of the signal without overly affecting its punchiness or the perceived level of that signal. So I've started using clipping quite a bit on snare drums for this reason. You can see that on this snare drum, I have the standard clip by Sir Audio Tools. And if we listen to the snare here, I'm not taking much off of it, maybe half a dB or so, but that half a dB of added headroom can help me further down the line when it comes to maximizing the overall level of the mix, either in pseudo mastering or once I send it off to a mastering engineer to do the mastering. I struggled for years to get my mixes up to a professional level when mastering them myself, largely because I was relying so much on limiting to reduce the dynamic range and drive the levels up. However, I found with limiting, we can really suck the life out of the transients and therefore the overall punchiness of the mix when we are really trying to push the levels up aggressively to get that commercially viable loudness level. So my earlier mixes had a lot of bass energy and transient energy that would trigger the limiter to act and ultimately mess up the entire mix that I had as I was trying to get to that loudness level of say negative nine LUFS or so. So I suppose as a bonus tip, I would highly suggest paying special attention to the sub bass energy of the mix and ensuring that that is not too loud because that is a surefire way to eat up headroom and ultimately suck the life out of your mixes when it comes time to try to maximize the loudness of those mixes. So a little bit of clipping on transient information can help drastically increase the headroom. In this case, I'm not using it too hard on the snare drum right here. However, as I was saying with clipping, we can really clip our transient information rather hard while still maintaining that punch and getting the added benefit of extra headroom within the mix. So that, along with not overdoing the sub bass frequencies, will help tremendously when it comes time to maximize the loudness of your mixes, especially if you plan on mastering them yourself. And one more thing with clipping here, we can see I'm using this same clipping plugin right here on the drum subgroup. And if we have a listen to this. see that I'm just using it to tame a few of those peaks. It's not clipping throughout the entirety of the drum bus, but it's just really capping off that maximum level so that the limiter right here will be able to react to a set maximum peak level and nothing above that peak level. So in this case on the drums, I'm clipping them a little bit and then I'm also limiting them, but I'm using the limiter in a way that is not going to suck the life out of the drums, but rather just help to maintain that dynamic range and to control the overall dynamics of the drums. One thing I need to mention about clipping is that when we are clipping the longer waveforms of low frequency content, we will hear the distortion that is produced by clipping much more than if we are clipping signals with higher frequency content. So we should be very careful with kick drums not to clip them too hard and cause unnecessary or unruly distortion within the mix. All right, speaking of distortion, technique or concept number six is the use of saturation. Once I learned about saturation, it kind of changed the whole way I look at mixing. Saturation is effectively the combination of soft knee compression with harmonic generation. So it will take whatever harmonics or audio content are in a signal and enhance the harmonics that are already there and even produce other harmonics. And so on bass elements that have a lot of fundamental energy in the low end, it will create more frequencies or harmonics in the mid range to help enhance the overall presence of the bass elements. So I often use saturation on bass, sometimes on kick drum. I didn't use it in this particular mix. And in tracks that already have a lot of mid range energy, it can really help add that analog warmth to the signal. I have a video going into depth on the various types of saturation. I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below. So I won't go into detail about it here, but effectively a bit of subtle saturation or distortion can help us get that analog feel or that imperfectness or that warmth or whatever you'd like to call it. So a little bit of harmonic generation can go a long way in helping to glue things together and helping to make things stand out if need be. And it's just an overall super important process that I use on every one of my mixes. Now my go-to saturation plugins are the FabFilter Saturn 2, 
We have a tape emulation here. We have multiple tube emulations, subtle tape, clean tape, warm tape, old tape. We've even got amp simulations, which I use sometimes, but not so much. Saturation, gentle, heavy, and subtle. We've got transformer style saturation, and then we've got a few effects. I will primarily focus on tube saturation, which is focused primarily on the even order harmonics and generating those, and tape saturation, which is primarily focused on creating odd order harmonics. Of course, those are generalities, and the special thing about saturation that I love is that no two saturation algorithms are the same, and the profile of harmonic generation varies depending on how hard you drive them, meaning that as I drive a tape algorithm, for example, harder, it won't just produce more of the harmonics that it's already producing, it will actually produce a varying amount of different harmonics, if that makes sense. Once again, there's a video in the description box down below if you'd like to learn more about saturation and all the details that I don't have enough time for in this particular video. So we've got Saturn 2. I really like the Decapitator by Sound Toys right here. We've got five different styles to choose from. If I'm not mistaken, we have a Ampex style right here, an EMI channel strip right here, a Neve style right here, and then a triode and a pentode right here for tube style saturation. So we've got a tube style saturation with A, we've got a transformer style with E, a transistor style with N, and then two tube styles right here with the T and the P. I believe those are the saturation plugins I'm using on this mix in particular, but also we have options in a lot of Logic's stock plugins. We have, for example, the compressor right here with a distortion module right here where we can get sort of soft style, hard style, or clipping style, distortion, or saturation. Beyond that, we can go to our vintage EQ selection, which emulates old analog vintage hardware, which inherently has saturation within it. We have tape delay, which has a character function right here, which emulates tape distortion or tape saturation. There are a lot of different ways to get saturation within the mix beyond just saturation plugins. So I just wanted to show you that. And I even go as far as using saturation sometimes on the mix bus. So in this case, I have my go-to Fab Filter Saturn 2. You can see that it's working because it's actually acting on my voice right now. But I'll play this back and we can hear what it sounds like with and without saturation on the mix bus right here. So it just helps warm it up a little bit and you can imagine how this would sound on each individual track leading up to the mix bus. So without saturation, we can get mixes that sound rather clinical, rather digital, rather dry. And with saturation, we can really help warm up our mixes and help things get a more cohesive glue to the mix. Concept number seven is to always have a focal point and mixing is not necessarily about making everything clearly heard at the same time throughout the entirety of the mix. Rather, it's about directing the listener's attention to what is most important at any given point. And so in most cases, it is the vocal that should take the primary focal point within the mix. And we have a lot of vocals in this song. So if I play back any particular instance, you'll hear that the vocals are right up in the center and they are the focal point. They are a bit louder than everything else. The background vocals are pushed to the sides and the lead vocal really gets to shine. Let's go to the bridge, for example. You throw me out, uh, oh, you're begging me, please, uh, and I wouldn't even doubt it, but some my bro, you'll be down on your knees, uh, darling, why you put me out, why you treat me so mean? So you hear there that the lead vocal is right up in the center, it's the focal point, and then in this section right here, we kind of get the background vocals hugging the lead vocal right there to give a nice effect and a nice wide vocal in this part of the performance. However, during the sax solo, we have the saxophone as the main element that I want to draw the listener's attention to. So if we listen to this, we'll hear the saxophone in the center and as the loudest part in the mix. And if you were listening to the guitars in this particular section, you would hear them out to the left and right. However, in this part right here, we have a section where I wanted to bring the funk guitar into the center. And so what you see here is I'm slowly automating guitar one so that it takes up the center of the mix right here. 
And if I look at the other automation, we have a send mute to the funk parallel compression. And so when this part comes about, the funk guitar is the focal point of the mix and it is also being sent to the parallel compression that I have for it set up right here. So let's open up this so that we can see the audio going into the funk guitar parallel compression and just have a brief listen to this. So in that section, we're just kind of jamming out. It's after a chorus. And so it's just a nice break where the listener can also sort of take a break and listen to what's going on. We can focus more on the drums. We can focus on the bass, but you hear that guitar kind of sweeping slowly toward the center until we reach this point in the mix where it becomes the focal point. the saxophone come in and take the place of the guitar as the guitar is no longer being sent to the parallel compression bus there and it gets panned back out to the sides and then going back to the vocal after the saxophone wraps up the vocal then takes the place of the center stage within the mix So there's typically something that is the focal point that I want to direct the listener's attention to. This is part mixing, part music production, but it's worth keeping in mind as you go through your mixes, not only of your own material, but of others' material as well. All right, concept or technique number eight that has improved my mixes is LCR panning or left center right panning. Now this is a method of panning where things can either be hard panned left, center, or right. I don't personally use this strictly. I use more of a hybrid system where I can pan things not only hard left, hard right, or to the center, but elsewhere within the stereo spectrum. However, the overall concept still guides many of my moves when it comes to panning. And so you'll see these guitars right here are panned 30 and plus 30. In Logic, this is not percentage, it actually goes up to negative 64 or positive 63. So 30 is about halfway or 50% to the left and to the right. But you see here that I am panning the guitars equally to opposite sides. The horns, I'm going ahead and hard panning. The toms, I never hard pan because I don't really like the sound. It doesn't sound natural in the kit, nor does the hat I find. I'll usually just pan it a bit off center but you'll see that a lot of these tracks are panned directly in the center. I'm no longer messing around with more intermediate panning unless I'm doing something with orchestral elements, for example, but typically in modern production, I will have things just panned slightly off center if I need them to get out of the way of the vocal or the bass or the kick or the snare. And other than that, I'm really thinking, okay, where can I position these elements to even directions to the left or the right? So it's not always hard left and hard right, but going back to the guitars in this example, how far should I spread them out so that I get that width and open up some center space? And typically I will pan them to equal amounts to either side. So this helps with the overall width and the contrast within the mix, which helps with width. And it also helps to maintain proper mono compatibility because we have a strong center without a bunch of stuff just panned slightly off, which will sound phasey and strange whenever the mix happens to be collapsed to mono. So with LCR panning, I make as strong a center image as possible. And then the contrast of the panned elements or the stereo effects really help to fill out the width of the mix. And we can just have a listen to the outro, for example, just as a part where things are panned out as far as they are within the entirety of the mix. <laughs> Can't you see me like you saw her? Hey. 
So the kick, the snare, the vocal, the bass, they are strong up the center. And we've got the guitars and the horns and the stereo effects filling out the width within the mix. All right, technique number nine is using sidechain compression for something other than EDM pumping. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of got started with music production by doing hip hop and electronic dance music. And so I thought of sidechain compression as just sidechain everything to the kick and just get that pumping. And that was the technique of sidechain compression. However, when it comes to mixes, I use sidechain compression all the time to help add rhythm to certain tracks. Usually when I'm working with something that is more live off the floor with this, the drummer and the musicians themselves will kind of take care of that rhythmic pulsing for me. However, if I'm using a sample or a loop that is kind of lacking character, I'll sometimes use sidechain compression to just give a little bit of that subtle amplitude modulation to the signal to help give it a little bit more of a human feel, particularly if I have strong snare or kick drum that I can use to sidechain compress that. However, in many mixes, including this one, I will use sidechain compression subtly to help with frequency masking. So in the chorus, for example, we have horns and vocals going on at the same time, and they take up a lot of the same frequencies in the mid range. And so what I have here is on the horn bus or the horn subgroup, a compressor, and I have the sidechain keyed to the lead vocal. So whenever the lead vocal is present, it will duck the amplitude of the horn bus, which effectively reduces the volume of all of the horns together. So if we have a listen here, we can see the gain reduction happening to the horn bus. I'll toggle this on and off so that we can hear the difference as well. It's subtle, but worth doing in the mix to just help that vocal pop out a little bit more and to push the horns back a little bit in the mix where they belong. So that just helps with frequency masking, helping the vocal again to be a bit more upfront and the horns to be pushed a little bit back where they belong in the mix. Technique number 10 is using intricate level automation throughout the mix to really hone in on the dynamics, particularly on vocals. So when we are learning about compression as a dynamic range processor, we can tend to over rely on compression to control the dynamics of a signal. However, we get the most control over the dynamics of a signal by actually automating the volume automation or the fader in this case. So you see here that across the mix, it's not so much the case in the first verses and the choruses, but you see here that once the vocal starts getting a little more dynamic, I really went in and made fine tune automation to the levels to really control the dynamics of the lead vocal in this case. So this for me was important because it made me stop relying so much on compression, which wasn't always doing the job and got me more in the mindset that automation is an important and invaluable tool in mixing across the board, not only in intricate moves like this, but in moves across the board to help tame dynamics and to add excitement and sonic interest to the mix. All right, technique or concept number 11 is gain staging. Now you'll see that in this mix or any other mix that I show you that has been done in recent years, you'll find a gain plugin at the beginning of each of my audio tracks right here. So on this instance, we have a sample. We have another sample right here. We have a VCA right here. It's an effects return, but any of the audio tracks, I will have a gain plugin right here. And I will, before I start the mix, not have any other plugins right here. And I will go through and set my gain so that I'm reading at about negative 20 to negative 18 on each of my tracks. And that way I know that I will have adequate headroom throughout the mixing process. And most importantly for me, when I'm mixing is I will have my faders represent relative volumes. So it's no longer the case that one track at Unity will be at zero dBFS and another track at Unity will be at negative 20. No, I'm going to set them with proper gain staging so that at Unity they are both at about negative 20 to negative 18. And that way I can quickly see visually here what my faders are doing. So that for me personally is the biggest benefit of gain staging. I go into much more detail in a video. I will link to that video on gain staging in the description box down below if you'd like to learn more. It's a hotly debated topic, but I use it and it has helped me, I feel, in my mixes. So that's why I talk about it and share it with you here on the Mighty Microphone YouTube channel. All right, so gain staging is pretty simple in this regard. So moving on to number 12, technique number 12, is actually using effects returns. 
I never used to use effects returns. I feel like a lot of people who are just getting into music production don't take advantage of effects returns, but effectively this saves us from having to put our reverb plugins or our delay or our parallel processing directly on a channel. Rather, we can set up our audio channels. In this case, let's take the lead vocal and then we can send audio from this channel to an effects return. In this instance, the lead vocal is being sent to the stereo delay, to the mono delay, to the vocal reverb, and to a vocal delay throw, which is toggled on and on or muted and unmuted throughout the mix. So in this case, if we go to bus 13, I believe it is over here, we have our stereo delay, which has the stock stereo delay plugin with 180 milliseconds to the left, 220 milliseconds to the right. And so I'm sending audio from the lead vocal to this stereo delay, and then the stereo delay is being sent to the stereo output. So with this effects return, I'm sending audio from the lead vocal. This audio is then being affected with delay right here. So I do not have to have this stereo delay over on the lead vocal and then mess about with the left and right output. I can just have a effects return with the stereo delay. And then I have a situation where I can send not only the lead vocal, but also in this case, the background vocals, the horns bus, and a few other tracks to this single stereo delay, and then have all of that audio being affected by this single delay plugin. So that's super beneficial for having a common processor that will affect audio from multiple channels. It helps reduce CPU load and overall processing on the computer, but it also helps tremendously in having independent control over the lead vocal and the stereo delay. So in this case, I can move up the fader volume of the lead vocal. I can add different effects to the lead vocal without necessarily affecting the delay. And similarly, I can go and add in different processors or plugins on this delay. Let's say I wanted some distortion on this. We could go to our Fab Filter Saturn 2 and add some saturation to just the delay without affecting the original vocal signal right here. And it just adds a whole bunch of control to the effects that we are using in our mix. The same thing goes for reverb effects returns or parallel processing like parallel compression right here or anything that we would like to set up on an effects return. So this one I learned long ago, but it has been a total game changer then and continues to be an invaluable tool in mixing today. All right, and concept number 13 that has helped my mixes dramatically is the fact that great mixes are begun in the production, tracking, and editing. So in other words, you can't polish a turd. For years in my own music, I was not producing or recording my stuff correctly. And so when it came time to mix, I was effectively mixing tracks and sessions that were unmixable. So getting tight performances during tracking is super important. And then going through and having the time to edit not only for timing, but also for pitch is invaluable when it comes to setting yourself up for success in a mix. So even in a session like this, which is live off the floor and the musicians are really good and they are grooving together, I still went through and did a little bit of drum editing just to clean up a few fills, a few hits that were a bit too early or a bit too late. I went through and did a bit of subtle tuning on the horns, the vocals, the background vocals. I did a little bit of time alignment with the background vocals just to make them really tight with the lead vocals. And this really helped when it came time to mix, just having as tight a performance and a production as possible. So I think that that is super important. And you can really learn this if you are just getting into mixing by signing up for a mix competition or finding yourself some free multi-tracks to practice on and just seeing and working on what a professionally produced song sounds like and looks like in the mix. And you may find that your mixing skills aren't nearly as bad as you thought they were. It's just that you were working on projects that were too difficult or unmixable in the first place. And just before we get out of Logic Pro, when I'm editing drums, I will typically do it manually. You see here that even my toms, I am actually manually cutting so that the toms only appear in the audio file when they are present. I do the same thing with the hi-hats. I don't really like toggling the mute on and off. I would rather just cut up the audio when I'm drum editing. That's just a preference of mine. And of course, when I am drum editing, I will go through my drums and turn on the group so that whatever I edit there will be edited on each of the drums. So let's say I wanted to edit right here. I could cut this and then everything would cut at the same time. And if I wanted to move it, everything would move so that I'm not getting any particular phase issues as I move certain tracks within the drum tracks relative to others. Now, when it comes to aligning vocals, 
I really like a plugin called Vocaline. Now this is the mixing session, so you won't see any of these plugins right here. But if you go to audio units, it is Synchro Arts Vocaline Ultra AU. And effectively you set up a side chain to a vocal or performance that you want to align your vocal to, then you play through and Vocaline will do its best to automatically align a performance to another performance. So I like using that on vocals, on horns, and other instruments that need to be really tight in the mix. And when it comes to tuning, my go-to is the Celimony Melodyne which is a fantastic plugin that not only helps to tune monophonic instruments like vocals and horns, but can also even tune polyphonic instruments. Super powerful, I love using it, and perhaps I will put together a video going in depth about how I use Melodyne in the future. But that's it for now in Logic Pro, the 13 concepts and techniques that have drastically helped me improve my mixes. There you go. All right, so those are 13 of the concepts and techniques that have drastically improved my mixes. Once again, they are using consistent workflow, thinking of mixes in three-dimensional space, not being afraid to push our processors really hard when it is appropriate to do so, using high shelf boosts, using clipping, having saturation on tracks, buses, and the mix bus, always having a focal point in the mix, using LCR or left center right panning, using sidechain compression beyond the typical EDM pumping, using intricate automation on volume levels to really hone in the dynamics of a single track, particularly on vocals, gain staging and level matching, using effects returns, and learning that great mixes start in the production and editing of the track. So again, those are the 13 concepts and techniques that have helped me personally, but I'd love to open up this conversation and hear what techniques and concepts have helped you the most in your mixes. So leave a comment below. Let's get a discussion started because I'm sure that I've missed a few that have really helped you. So take these techniques and concepts discussed in this video, apply them to your mixes, and let me know how it goes as well in the comments below. If you'd like to learn more about mixing in a practical way, I have a free mixing guidebook that you can check out by clicking the first link in the description box down below. This will help walk you through my typical workflow and go through the step-by-step -step processes of mixing to help you make the right decisions or the right thought processes in the right order to help you make better and more consistent mixes. So once again, if you are interested, it's free. It is the first link in the description box down below. So check it out. And if you'd like to spend more time with me here on the My New Microphone YouTube channel, as always, I would invite you to hit that subscribe button and to check out another few videos I have for you in the top left or right corner. So click on one of these videos and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.